Hi, my name is Tony Ariemi, and I am the author of Children of Blood and Bone and Children of Virtue and Vengeance. I'm coming to you live from San Diego, California, and I'm excited to be at the National Book Fest, the online National Book Fest. So I pitched the Children of Blood and Bone series as Black Panther with Magic. It follows, my first book follows a girl fighting to bring magic back to her people. And so it's just epic West African adventure with West African mythology. So you get to meet the Orisha, you get to run in jungles, you get to ride a giant lion, you get to fall in love, you get epic battles. Um, it really is everything I'd ever wanted in a book because I've always grown up with a big love for magic and for fantasy, especially young adult fantasy. So that's the first adventure. And then the sequel, I won't spoil it, but we follow Zaley on a continued adventure. So I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> so that if you haven't read this series, there's no spoils, but both books follow Zaley and really an adventure to fight for her people and protect her people. And even though it's an epic, West African fantasy, its themes really closely mirror issues we're going through today, especially the first book. The first book was written as a fantasy, but also an allegory to the modern Black experience. So I think they're on their first levels, great stories, exciting stories, the adventures we love, but deeper, there's a lot, I call it cake with asparagus. Um, so the cake is the adventure, but the emotions and the emotional realities of what the characters are going through, like that's the asparagus for me, because I wanted people to be able to understand. Again, I think I'm a very empathetic person, but I also think a lot of human, humans are complex, not just the issues we go through, but what we're feeling, what they feel like. And so I really wrote these so that it'd be easier to understand the pain people are going through that's not always easy to verbalize. But I also wanted big giant lions and magic. So that is my book series. Um, the story of how I discovered the mythology that led me to write the series, what to me it's very much fate um, because the Orisha, the West African tradition, it is something that is, it started with my culture because I'm Nigerian American, my parents are Yoruba. And so even though this has been a part of my culture, I didn't learn about it until I got a fellowship to Brazil after college. Um, and it was a fellowship specific to the English department at Harvard and it allowed students, honor students to apply for a place they would want to go to and why. So I applied for Brazil because I wanted to go to Brazil and I wanted someone else to pay for it. But then when I thought, okay, like what reason would I have to go here? I originally went to study their history of the slave trade because Brazil is the most interesting parallel to the United States in terms of their society during the slave trade. Um, and they're an interesting parallel because they brought 10 times as many slaves to Brazil as America did. So there's a lot of similarities between our societies, especially the racial issues we've had, but there's a lot of differences. And so once I decided I wanted to go to Brazil, I thought like, okay, I've learned a lot about civil war literature, about slave literature in the English department. I'd love to study their journey. And I think there's a Toni Morrison as story in there about two sisters separated by the slave trade, like a, a multi-generational thing that I would be awful at writing. And I would have been even worse at writing when I was studying this outside of college. But I was okay with someone paying for me to go to Brazil and me discovering that I was not capable of writing a story that complicated. Um, but when I got to Brazil, the museum that was going to be the cornerstone of my research was closed for renovations. Um, and so I'm in Salvador, Brazil. It's raining. I couldn't get my hair wet, so I duck into a gift shop, and the gift shop owner is kicking out people who are clearly there to avoid the rain. So I'm like, use those big eyes. And I'm like really looking around like, oh, like, oh, 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 like really just milking it. Um, but then I came across the Orisha for the first time and they were these postcards. And I didn't know what they were. There was no, there was no like headings. So I didn't know what I was looking at, but 
I was just seeing magical, sacred depictions of what felt like Black deities. And it was the first time in my life. Like, I love magic. I love imagery. I love mythology. So I was so intimately familiar with with mythologies and religions from all over the world, but I never seen my own. So it felt like I went to Brazil to discover what was in my backyard the entire time. And once I learned that these amazing pictures that I was seeing were the Orisha, once I learned that not only was that part of Nigerian heritage, but it was part of Yoruba heritage, it was like, a story to me is like a, a 500 piece puzzle, um, except you, you, you maybe start out with like 50 of the pieces. So first you have to find the other 450 pieces and then you have to figure out how they come together to create a really beautiful picture. Um, and I love it. We're faced with a lot of problems right now. I think the unique thing about it is, as I was describing in it, like life is full of these issues and it's very rare that everyone hits the same event wall. And I think that's what Corona is. Um, everyone's handling it differently. How it's disrupting people's lives is completely different. But for once, we're all hitting the same stone in, or the same wall in a way that I think we haven't done as a society since like World War II. So that's what ingenuity is to me. It's that's the only thing we can count on in life is that there will be problems, um, that there will be pain. Like that's the guarantee. That's the only thing that's solid. And so I look at everything big or small is like, okay, the pain is guaranteed. The suffering is guaranteed. As soon as we took our first breath, um, we knew that one day we were going to take our last. It's funny. It was writing this book where it kind of like hit me because the Zaley's journey in this book is about learning not to run away from pain. And that was sort of my journey in life of being like, oh, I see all this pain and I was trying to run away from it. But once I accepted, wait, like no pain is there. It's the guarantee. That's the problem. So how do we solve it? Um, how do you solve the micro pain in your life? How do you solve the micro pain in a friend or family member's life? How do you solve the macro pain on a societal level? Um, it's all problems, but I think that's why my mind has sort of made a game out of solving it because I believe most problems are solvable. And even if they're not completely solvable because of human nature, I still think if we're getting like a 10, if we're, I still think you can get an A even if you can't get an A plus. And I think we're not close to an A as a society. Um, and I think the vast majority of us aren't even close to an A in our personal life. So I think that's where my, that's what ingenuity means to me. It's like, how can you get that A? That's also a huge nerd mindset, but that's okay. <laughs> Cause that, yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is to me. Why did something like this resonate? It's because the world was true, but instead of having to show police brutality through really dehumanizing and graphic videos of the people who have died, I can take you through, I can kind of give you, I'm, I don't want to say the Disney World version, but it, it, it's painful, but it's, it's, it's safer than watching a video of George Floyd. It's safer than watching Philando Castile and his wife and, or his, his girlfriend and, his girlfriend's daughter in the car after he's been, you know, like those things are very hard to watch. They're very hard to watch. It's important to watch them because it's incredibly important to know the truth and to always look at the truth. I think as humans, especially we look away from the truth a lot and that gets us in trouble. It's better to know the truth and then create systems to make that truth better than to pretend the truth doesn't exist. But those are really hard and those aren't necessarily images that I would want to give to like a 12 year old or a 14 year old who's both in their childhood, but starting to learn about the world. So I feel like stories give us this really beautiful roller coaster ride where we can look at life, but within the same, it's like, don't, 
don't take off your seatbelt, don't touch things outside the video. I think that's what the story is. It's like you get to ride through it. And then at the end, you have to step off into the real world again, but you do it with a new awareness. You do it with new learning, new truths. You do it with ideally wanting to, to act differently in this world to make that really harsh truth a little bit better. I've sat with these things um, and I forced myself to look at the truth. And that was the only way I was able to kind of get back to myself. There was a period maybe four years ago. I guess for me, my, my George Floyd was Philando Castile. Um, so I felt like I was four years ahead of the intense trauma and sadness and grief that I was seeing 360 degrees. Um, but again, it's like, not only have I forced myself to look at these things, I forced myself to analyze them. I forced myself to understand them as best as possible so that I could replicate them in a fictional setting as best as possible. Um, and every book I've written has been incredibly therapeutic to me. Like this helped me get through when I started writing this book, it was difficult for me to drive because I was ter I had emotional PTSD from all the videos I was seeing of black people being stopped by cops while they were in their cars and getting shot and dying. So it's like, I couldn't go to like a Walgreens without my body freezing up and being a little bit scared. I couldn't go get like jelly beans without being like, you might die. Um, and that was obviously very difficult. So getting, it's not that the fear went away because that it's still the reality. It's not like, oh, you wrote the book and there's no more racism. Cool. No, that wasn't the situation, but that it didn't have that terror over me because I think, I honestly think we have to grieve life. Um, we, I think we have to grieve life. I think we have to go through, and I think it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, and it's weird because accepting the cruelty of life to me isn't laying down and taking it. I still feel, I feel more dedicated to fighting these things than I did before I started, but the acceptance means that the terror isn't there anymore. Um, the, I can get in my car without worrying, not because the fear isn't real, but it's because I've at least accepted that and that's integrated with my understanding of life and now I can go get my jelly beans. I'm like militantly passionate about representation um and it's because it's something that is incredibly difficult to quantify it's incredibly difficult to quantify what it means and so but i i at least have personal quantification of what representation has done in my life um and what not having representation did in my life. So what not having representation did in my life is that I, in the first story I ever wrote, I wrote it somewhere between like five and eight, but I had just seen The Parent Trap with Lindsay Lohan and I was desperate for a twin. I was reading The Saddle Horse Club or The Saddle Club, I think it's Saddle Horse Club, I think. It's this middle grade series and it was about three girls on a horse farm. I really wanted a horse. Um, I was watching a Bollywood film every day called Kapi Kushi Kapi Gam and I really wanted a sari and to like every now and then break out in an epic, well choreographed dance with everyone in society. Um, and I wanted all these things. I asked my parents for them, they said no. So I wrote my first story. And I gave myself a twin, I gave myself a horse. We had to get the parents back together over a summer on a horse farm while wearing the exact same outfits from Kabi Kushi Kabi Gab. And it was amazing. And when I read the story, it's so funny and I laugh, but then every story from that age, well, we'll, we'll just say eight, from eight till 18, for 10 years, every story I wrote, the characters, the main character was white or biracial. And it was really tragic for me when I, when I realized what I was doing because everything I wrote was what I wanted. So if I was writing about 
a white girl who could shoot lightning out of her hands. It was because I wanted to shoot lightning out of my hands and I also wanted to be white. And I was doing this for 10 years alone in my room because I didn't show anyone my writing until I was around 21. So with no one telling me anything, with no one saying you can't have a black person in your story, I had erased myself from my imagination. I had subconsciously internalized that I could not be a part of my own imagination. Because if I didn't see people who look like me in all the anime shows, in all the movies, and all the books, and all the magazines, and all the films, you know, we, we internalize erasure. They're like, oh, I must not belong there. Um, and that went really deep. It went all the way in here and in here. And I still, that was 18. So I have one more year before I would have spent as much time learning to live in my imagination as I did erasing myself from my imagination. And look look at what has happened in the 10 years where I've allowed myself to live in my imagination. Um, and so I cling to the sources of representation that I did have at that time that I didn't even realize. One, a big one was scandal. Um, Olivia Pope and her affair with the president. And she was also a problem solver. And what am I addicted to? Problem solving. Um, Lupita and that blue, that beautiful light blue dress, wearing that, uh, holding the Oscar and winning it and being radiant and celebrated. I cling to that. Um, and the other big source for me was America's Next Top Model. I didn't even realize that because I'd been re-binging it over quarantine. And I realized that I'm like, yo, Tyra, we need to talk because for 22 seasons, you showed me people who weren't like the girls in the magazine. You showed me people like me and you told them that if they worked hard, if they studied, if they became the best they could be, then they could be in those places too. Um, and so I look at myself as the product of my parents um, and my Nigerian heritage which really forces you just to work hard that's really what i think it's an, i think nigerians work really hard um they're really passionate about studying things um and they're hustlers so i got that part of me from my parents and from being nigerian and then i got this you belong in your imagination from just three ladies who weren't even working together so i'm like i'm in a place now where i I know that if little Tony had walked into a bookstore and seen this, she wouldn't have spent 10 years erasing herself from her imagination. I think fantasy is immensely important and storytelling, things like Black Panther, you know, it's like we measure things with box office success, but like I said, we cannot, we don't have enough good metrics for representation. But something like that story being a global success is huge because one, not only does it not show black people being oppressed, which is way too much of our imagery, um, it, it shows them, it shows, it shows humans, it shows humans and we're all human. And so I think that's why stories are especially important because it's, it's removed enough for us not to be Twitter fighting about every little detail or the semantics or the this, um, but it's realistic enough for us to get the valid lessons. And so that's, that's the lesson, the lesson, at least with this series. Um, Cause especially with this book, my goal was, I want someone to understand how I feel when I'm shaking in the car, afraid to go get some groceries. If you can understand how I feel, then when we talk about it, we can have a pretty good discussion. But, but it's pretty hard to talk about trauma. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not laughing because I'm like, oh, trauma. But I'm like, it's difficult to discuss trauma. Um, and it's usually not good to have someone discuss their own trauma, even if you're trying to help them. And so I'm like, oh, this is a great place to start. So you can understand a little bit how I'm feeling, because I find if I understand how someone is feeling, it's a lot easier to get to a solution or to get to peace. And then at the end of it, most times humans just want to be seen and heard. We just want to be seen and heard. 
Um, that's like usually 80% of the problem. It's just like, oh, you're not seeing me, you're not hearing me, and that hurts. Um, so yeah, I think these stories are important because it's literally you see, you hear, you ideally understand, and then again, you get to walk, you get to get off the theme park ride and step into the world and say, huh, okay, I see more, I see a lot more than I did before I started. I can't fix everything, but what can I do? Let me do that. Again, we can't, it's the, there's so many of us, but if everyone just did one thing to make the world like a consciously better place and they dedicated themselves to that, what would happen? So, so that's my, that's, that's how I feel. <laughs> I get very lost in every question, but that's how I feel. I think stories are very important. <laughs>